So automatic exposure controls, I think it's chapter 27 in our textbook. Um, and I don't want to belabor the point here, but uh, for any of us who watched the 13 seconds of Star Wars, pretty famous scene where the guy just keeps on saying, stay on target, stay on target. And he sounds really bored. Like, where is he? Is he just kind of on the beach somewhere? Um, but that, that is, in a nutshell, that's all we're worried about with the AEC. Stay on target. If you think about it as a targeting system, it is kind of the, um, the heat-seeking missile targeting system. That's kind of what it does. So hopefully that will help us. We don't need to overthink this. Um, but I do want us to be able to define the parts of the automatic exposure control, the AEC system. And there's about four or five important parts to it, and they all function in significant ways that we should be able to understand. Uh, we want to look at the AEC circuit, um, talk about errors and limitations. So there'll be two separate slides, one for errors like user errors or ways to misuse the system, and then a separate thing that talks about limitations, things it just can't do. Even if you set it up right, it can't do this, right? Um, and then finally, we'll talk about how does this impact our pictures? If we do this with the AEC, does that wind up with an overexposed image or an underexposed image? And so that's where we'll kind of go back and talk again about digital imaging. Because there's really no way for me to evaluate, to look at the picture and say, yeah, that's overexposed, yeah, that's underexposed anymore, right? With film, you could definitely tell. You knew the, the AEC, something was off. With, with our systems now, we got to check that um, exposure indicator or a deviation index or something. We need a, a metric or a number that will tell us. So what is the AEC? Well, these are four important parts to the AEC, and these are the things that are consistently tested on, right? So your quiz today has four questions based on this slide alone, right? It is first and foremost ion chambers, right? Um, arranged on the Bucky in a triangle shaped pattern. So that's why I'm saying it's like a targeting system and I'm comparing it to the targeting system of an X-wing fighter, right? Because it has, in this case, it has this weird little, looks like a Mickey Mouse kind of thing. It's got Mickey Mouse ears and a funny weird face. That is the AEC. Those are the ion chambers, right? That is what we're using for targeting. Um, and it's important that they're in that triangle shape. We can change the orientation. We can change what's activated for the ion chambers, and that will affect the exposure that we receive. Then there, anytime we're, we're dealing with electronics, there is a minimum response time. And it is a really, really short period of time, right? That from a circuit being energized to response, um, requires some very, very small amount of time, like 0 .002 seconds is an example of a minimum response time. You don't need to memorize that number. Just know that if the ideal exposure was shorter than the minimum response time, the AEC hasn't even kicked on yet. So I could inadvertently overexpose the patient. So we'll talk about ways to consider that. But that is what the MRT or the minimum response time refers to. There is also generally a backup system. And this works exact opposite of the minimum response time, right? So let me, let me zoom in here. This can be a little obnoxious. I'm going to zoom in first so you see how the ion chamber works, right? This is the workings of an ion chamber. You can almost think about it as being like an x-ray tube, right? What's happening as this thing works, I'll draw on this just a little bit, we have radiation entering this air space. It's just air. So the radiation's entering that air space. It's ionizing gas. So sometimes it's called a gas ionization chamber. It's the same thing. It's ionizing the gas. As it's ionizing the gas, the electrons are drawn upwards towards this positively charged anode, right? And the net positively charged atoms are attracted down here towards a negatively charged plate, a cathode, right? So it's separating them out. You've got ionization occurring. The electrons are going towards the positive thing. The net positively charged um, atoms of the gas are going towards the negatively charged plate. 
and they generate a current. They generate a current which is then stored up in the capacitor. That's what's occurring inside of the ionization chamber. So we're using this process, this physical process, to determine whether or not the patient's received enough exposure for us to get a picture, right? Because to be perfectly clear, hopefully we're clear on this right now, the AEC in terms of where it's positioned, right, is you've got the x-ray tube, right? Let me go down here just a sec. I've got my x-ray tube. This is going to be a terrible drawing. Oh, my Lord. That is an x-ray tube, not a Smurf. Then I've got my patient, right? He's not, he's happy. And then I've got my ion chambers here. That's the AEC, the ion chambers. And then I have my image receptor. Okay? So it's picking up what's exiting the patient. What would I call what's exiting the patient in this ridiculous drawing? The remnant beam. It's recording the remnant beam and it's saying, after X amount of exposure from the remnant beam, we got a picture. So, tur so turn it off. Yeah, bless you. Let me zoom back out. So what happens if it's exposing and it keeps on exposing, there's some kind of problem. Like let's say there's a disconnect here in the ion chamber, or maybe the patient wasn't positioned quite right, or let's say we, we had an operator error, we told it we were shooting on the wall, Bucky, when really we were shooting on the table. That'd be a problem, right? So we need a backup timer. If we're going to use this thing, we have to have a way to, to shut it off. Because it's saying, until this ion chamber receives enough exposure, I'm not turning off the timer. Right? I'm going to expose, expose, expose. So we need to set a backup timer, and so we call it a backup mass or backup timer. And it's there to prevent excessive exposure. So if we know for sure you definitely should have had a picture by now, turn the thing off, regardless of what the ion chamber says. So we call that the backup mass or the backup timer. Um, it's generally not set to higher than like two to four times the average needed exposure for the procedure. So there we need to know what kind of mass to use if we really want to use an AEC right. But what y'all are seeing out in the clinic is the total opposite. People are just kind of blindly using the AEC for everything. They couldn't tell you what the mass is. But what I just said is if you don't know what the mass is, you don't know how to use the AEC because you don't understand what the backup timers do. That's why, the, that's why they want us to know this material is to prevent patient overexposure. Finally, there's a density control and it uses, and he gets really into the weeds in this chapter on the density control. Don't fret the weeds on the density control. You just bump it up or bump it down depending on if you want to kind of darken the picture. Like if I have a larger patient, I might bump the density, expo the density controls up. If I have a thinner patient than normal, like a, a, a weaker patient, I might bump the density controls down and it has a negative one or a negative two. Are you all familiar with that setting on the AEC? Have you seen the text kind of like, oh, I'm going to bump it up a little bit. That's what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'll, uh, I can show you in the lab. So those are the nuts and bolts of how the AEC, the parts of it that are important. I'm going to walk us through the circuitry now for how those parts interact. And this, is, this slide is kind of A, B, C, D because this is the order in which things are happening. So here's a much better drawing of what I was trying to draw before. We have an x-ray tube. There's some x-rays coming down towards the patient here, right? Um, they're interacting with the patient. And what we don't have drawn here is the, the x-ray image, but generally it's behind the AEC ion chambers, right? Um, so, but A in this case is that gas ion chamber. So as the gas is ionized, the electrons, like we said, strike an anode plate um, becoming current. Is that correct? Let me double check that. Okay. 
Yeah, that's correct. Sorry. So the electrons become a current. I may have misspoke earlier. That current is then stored in a capacitor, right? If you're wondering what a capacitor is, it's basically a taser. Like if you've ever known someone that's gotten tased, they just get hit with a serious capacitor. That electrical discharge into the human body that's used in a taser is a form of capacitance. It's one of the reasons they say if you ever find like an old television set, don't take it apart, right? It's not just that there's lead inside the tube, there's these massive, massive capacitors in them. Like think about 100 times a taser, it would knock you across the room. Like if you touch that capacitor, it's still storing charge. Even if the, even if the TV has been, was switched off years ago, that capacitor is still holding a charge, right? So I feel like there's really an opportunity to use this in some kind of action movie at some point, but um, just know that. What we're talking about is something that has the ability to store charge. Now, interestingly enough, the human body is also a capacitor, right? That's why tasers work on people, is because we store charge as well. So if you hit someone with a capacitor, they're gonna store that charge now, not the capacitor. So, um, but the electrons are stored in the capacitor until they reach some kind of threshold almost like filling up a glass with water. Once the capacitor is filled up with all the water, with all the current being poured into it, it flows out of the capacitor. It can't store anymore, right? And then that's what shuts off this relay here. It opens the circuit terminating the exposure. So there's a little electromagnetic magnet here. The minute the capacitor is full up, it, the current flow, overflows the capacitor and it opens up the relay and it opens the circuit. The circuit was just broken and so the, the exposure stops, right? Now you'll notice I just skipped something. I skipped something called the thyrotron. So that's the fancy name for the density control thing. When you're hitting plus one or plus two or whatever, you're controlling the thyrotron, which can set some limits on what the capacitor exactly is doing, right? So don't get, again, don't get down into the weeds with all this stuff, just know Ion chamber collects charge. Charge is communicated to the capacitor. When the capacitor overflows, it breaks the relay, it breaks the circuit. If I'm messing with the, if I'm messing with the density controls, I'm messing with the thyrotron, right? Which controls how much electricity um, moves out of the capacitor. All right, let's talk about ways to not use this. First off, activate the correct Bucky, right? Um, kind of classic. Error, I think I've made this error, so that's why I'm telling you, do this. If I'm setting up for something that's on the wall, and all of a sudden something gets changed, and we realize, oh, we need to move the patient over the table, make sure you've switched over the bucky to the table, right? Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. Um, one of the things that we do not do often enough is examine the preset backup, backup timers. For the most part, the x-ray machines come from the factory with a backup time that's too high, for what we actually need, right? So if we need to hit the backup timer, like say we didn't set up right or we made the user error, like <coughs> not activating the correct Bucky, we've just overexposed the patient four, five, six, seven, ten times possibly, depending on what those faculty, those uh, factory presets were, right? So again, if we're going to use an AEC, we need to know what our mass should be, right? Otherwise, it's like we're, we're taking this thing out of the box without really knowing how to play with it, right? It would almost be like driving a car without really knowing whether it takes diesel or unleaded gasoline. You really need to know that before you take off in a car, right? So um, the AEC only controls the time. I can't stress that enough. It doesn't jack with your KVP. It doesn't jack with your MA. It only messes with the seconds, time and seconds. That's all the AEC affects is time, the duration of the exposure. We still need to know what an optimum KVP would be and roughly what a good MA would be, right? If we don't set a correct MA, we might hit the minimum response time, right? If we had the MA too high, we could wind up overexposing the patient in that way. Also, no amount of MA and no amount of AEC exposure can compensate for insufficient KVP. This is one of his big mantras. It's kind of like the golden rule of this textbook. And so he goes ahead and slips it in here too. 
And it's one of the reasons I sent out that video on the 15% rule, because this connects with the 15% rule. So if you have five minutes, I'd recommend watching that because he gets into what are we really talking about? What happens differently if I have a 70 KVP versus an 80 KVP? What really, what impacts um, with the patient, right? So no amount of MA will compensate for insufficient KVP. And this is just kind of repeating what I said earlier. The MA should be high enough to minimize motion, patient motion, voluntary or involuntary motion, um, but not so high that the times are shorter than the minimum response time. I'll say that yet again. So this thing is not perfect. It's got some limitations to it. So those, we just talked about the errors. Those would be things that we could do as technologists that aren't good. Here's the things that the system might do that aren't good, right? Um, and things to think about as we're setting up anytime we're using an AEC. We want the anatomy of interest to completely cover the detector cell. What am I talking about? Well, I'm going to go ahead and draw this up here. And I'm gonna, I'll draw it on the slide so that folks online can see. All right. I'm going to draw the lungs, right? And there, Oh, my goodness, it's going to be a terrible drawing, too. Worst critic. All right. Um, what am I drawing right now? What, what's, what is this? Boxes? This is not FedEx. Lungs and vertebrae. Yes, lungs and vertebrae. Thank you. So, and I've said that the AEC is this triangle-shaped pattern, right? I want to make sure that I've activated the correct things for what I'm looking at. So the AEC activated for the T-spine looks a lot different than the AEC activated for a PA chest, right? AEC activated for a T-spine looks like activating this detector cell right here because I'm interested in that anatomy. So that's what I'm activating, right? But if I'm interested in doing the chest, I got the Mickey Mouse ears out here that I want to activate. So I want to deactivate this one right here. I do not want a perfectly exposed T-spine on a chest x-ray. I want a perfectly exposed lung field and mediastinum. So I need to know what to activate. And that anatomy needs to completely cover the detector cell. So we don't use AECs on fingers or hands or wrists or ankles. And we seldom if ever use them on knees or anything like that. It needs to cover that ionization chamber. All right, so we got to watch out for any anatomy that's close to the skin, like clavicles. So if you want an example of what would be a screw-up with that, turn to page 40, 417 of your textbook, and you'll see a crappy picture that resulted from AEC usage with a clavicle. He's even done, been so kind as to draw the detector cell on there so that we have an idea of how this underexposure might have happened. We cannot see the bone at all. So our positioning and centering should be perfect. This is one of the reasons why if you've done or have you have yet to do um, a, a terminal a comp with me, I'm going to ask you where should you center, right? Do I really care about that anatomy? Yeah, kind of. Yes. But I'm yes, I do. <laughs> but what I'm really interested in is do you understand how in, as much as we use AEC, do you understand how important centering is, right? Cuz if I'm not centered right, I just threw off the AEC. I'm, my, I'm not using my targeting system right. I'm not staying on target. Um, positioning needs to be appropriate as well. We want to collimate to just the area of interest, right? Why would that be the case? Well, we know that poor collimation increases scatter in patient dose. Scatter could reach the ionization chamber and terminate the exposure too soon, right? So I want to collimate appropriately. Doesn't mean clip things off, but collimate to what's important for the exam. Um, don't use an AEC if the patient has any metal. And I mean orthopedic hardware, uh, external metal on their body, anything like that. Because what does metal do with x-rays? It stops them. Metal attenuates x-rays. So the problem is if there's metal in the area of the ionization chamber, I wind up frying my patient because the x-ray tube thinks I'm trying to x-ray metal. I don't x-ray metal, right? That's not my job. If you want to x-ray metal, you need to go into a different field. I think it's called like industrial x-ray or something like that, where you x-ray bombs and fighter planes and things, right? They do that. It is a, it is thing, a thing. 
But if you want an example of, and I, I try to search around online for pictures, but again, our textbook has the best possible pictures. Page 418, if you just turn the page, there's a great example of someone misusing the AEC, orthopedic hardware in place. It totally burned out the image. All I got was a really pretty picture of some orthopedic hardware. It looks like it's floating in space. And don't get so used to the AEC that you don't remember the manual of technique. The chances are um, that will happen. I put that on there as more a, it's not in the textbook anywhere, it won't be on the registry, but that's more aspirational. I mean, that's something to aspire to. That's a goal, a personal goal. I failed to do this as an x-ray tech. I got so used to the AEC um, that I couldn't have told you a manual technique. And now I'm saying, okay, next generation, don't fail in the way that I failed. Okay, this is important. So this is where this relates to image production. We've just kind of unpacked all the definitions, talked about how this thing works. Now what does it actually mean for our pictures? Well, there's two things that can happen if we misuse the AEC. The first is overexposure and the second is under. Different things will cause different results, right? So overexposure, what could cause my picture to have an exposure indicator that's too high? In the world of film, I would say the picture's blackened or the picture's burned out, right? There's too much density on it. It's too dark, right? But in the world of digital, I just say the exposure indicator is too high. Or if you're using a Fuji system, the S number is too low, right? Because it's inverse. Um, first thing would be wrong Bucky. I did not activate the correct Bucky. That's a user error, bad x ray tech, right? And it's, um, the needed exposure time was less than the minimum response time. So the MA was set too high. And the exposure could have actually terminated prior to the minimum response time. And it didn't because of the minimum response time. That's pretty rare. Density control set too high. So let's say I moved uh, Mr. Jones out who was morbidly obese, right? Now I've moved in this asthenic patient with emphysema and I'm doing their x-ray and I still have Mr. Jones's density control on there. It's still bumped up. That'd be a problem. I'd wind up overexposing the next patient. Hmm. Would the density control be like the different size, shape, body? Yeah. Where you tap yeah. It? Yeah. Some systems have like, they don't even have like a number. It just has a shape of a body or something. Yeah. I would be talking about like if it's too high, I've set it for the, the big patient. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great question. This system, like any system, can malfunction. So again, yeah, another reason why I need to know what manual techniques are because what happens if the AEC goes down? I've literally had, y'all think this will never happen. I've had two students now, just teaching for four years, AEC has gone down in their facility. I don't know what to do. They call me or they shoot me a text on GroupMe. I don't know what to do. When I say, remember the summer labs, right? Technique chart. It's time to make a technique chart. You gotta go back to X-ray 101. Um, Incorrect detector cell configuration, like the example I gave you earlier, I have it set up for a T-spine, I have that center AEC um, detector cell activated, but actually what I was shooting was a chest, that would result in overexposure, because it thinks I'm trying to get a T-spine, and it just burned out the lung fields. Um, if there's that radio-opaque artifact, that's just another way of talking about metal. So I just, I'm trying to use as many different terms for the same thing so that you are not thrown off by different ways of talking about the same thing. I'm talking about metal. If it says radio opaque, that means the x-rays can't see through it. That's what that fancy word means. The x-rays can't see through it. Radio opaque, so metal, artifact, like surgical hardware, um, piercings, barium, stuff like that. Or it could be outside their body, right? So to go back to the piercings thing, it could be some kind of crazy piercing they have, you know, out external to their body, right? So question, would nipple rings influence the AEC? Yes, they would, right? The short answer is yes, right? Why? Because they're an external radio opaque artifact. They're affecting, they're attenuating the x-ray beam. I'm sure you were all asking yourselves that question. Under exposure. <coughs> So these are things that are going to wind up in an image that's too light. So in the world of film, we would say it's not dark enough, it's too bright, right? Um, one way that we might talk about in uh, 
in digital is just to talk about brightness. It is too bright, right? We, we generally talk about brightness indicators. Um, so uh, exposure indicator, though, is too low. We didn't get enough dose for the picture. Well, it could be that the backup timer was shorter than the needed exposure. So we set a backup timer, and the exposure needed to continue, but it hit the backup timer, right? So we need to extend the backup timer out for this patient or for this population. Density control set too low. So I'm shooting a patient who's actually kind of big, but I selected the little tiny skinny person on the, on the dial, or I dialed it down to like negative one or negative two when I probably just need to leave it alone. Again, incorrect detector cell configuration. You'll notice that was on the last slide, and it's on this slide as well. So this one can result in both underexposure and overexposure, right? So what's an example of it resulting in underexposure? Well, let's say again, I'm trying to shoot a T-spine now, but I have the AEC set for a PA chest X-ray. I just underexposed the T-spine, okay? Um, and then detector cell is not fully covered by the anatomy. So we want to make sure that the anatomy is not too peripheral, like a clavicle. That's what that word peripheral means, more towards the edge of the skin. Um, anatomy is too small. I'm not going to be using the AEC on a finger or any of those little tinier pieces of anatomy, something that cannot completely cover the um, ionization chamber or poor centering. If I'm not centered appropriately for the AEC, it can wind up in cutting off the exposure too soon and underexposure. Finally, I'm not a big fan of uh, Pat Benatar, but you know, whenever the song comes on the radio, I think about automatic exposure control. So, um, hit me with your best shot. Uh, I don't remember when this came out. Terrible song. All right, thank y'all.